Hey there, welcome to my channel. Uh, in this video we're going to talk about the magic user in basic Dungeons and Dragons, or really in any kind of OSR, old school type Dungeons and Dragons. It's uh, often said that it's a very weak class. In fact, even in the original Dungeons and Dragons, the description of the magic user says they start off very weak but become very powerful. Um, and I was talking about kind of the hidden ways that you can make your character what you want in uh, another video, and I got a lot of good comments and a lot of DMs, and... Um, you know, I was I mostly referenced fighters in that because I think fighters are probably the most versatile. Um, but I got a question or, you know, comment with a question at the bottom by Ruben, and I'm going to read it. Um, it says, uh, how would you help the basic rules magic user to be able to participate more with magic? This is a good question because it doesn't allow me to go, just casting spells is not all you do. But yeah, referencing really directly magic. You want to give them some more magic. Um, are there some simple rules that you've used? Uh, that let them cast the spells they want without having to wait, days, wait a day to get them back, but also keep them from nuking everything to death. This shows that Ruben's probably played OSR games and knows that, in fact, the the spells that magic users have are quite powerful, um, even at first level. I think the the thing that makes people feel like they are weak is that they you know generally can only cast one or two spells a day. If you look at a more modern game like like Fifth Edition. Um, where you have cantrips and spell casters can cast like every round and blah blah blah. Relatively speaking, those individual spells are much weaker. So you're looking at you're trading quantity for power. I mean, in the end of the day, uh, a fifth edition magic user, even scaled back to to be equal to BX or whatever, is going to be more powerful in the sense that you can throw a cantrip every round. That's that's pretty powerful. But anyways, uh, we're not going to do that because I do not do cantrips. Uh, I've tried them a little bit, and I'll talk a little bit about that, but what I'll, I have some other ideas that, that go, uh, that stay within the boundaries of the rules, um, the rules, um, I think more, and things that I'm doing these days, but I have done a couple of things in the past that maybe you would want to try, so uh, I'm just going to, I got my house rules document here from a campaign I did a couple years ago using the, uh, the thousand, uh, yeah, the thousand towers, uh, land of a thousand towers, uh, world, uh, which is the world around the ASC module, which is actually real, yeah, ASC, which is really, uh, really cool. It's kind of this like future past kind of thing. But anyways, um, so I went through all the BX classes because I knew I wanted to do a long campaign. It was my first like full campaign in BX in a while, um, and I decided I was going to try to balance it a bit. So I did a few things to to do that. Uh, one of which I changed some of the ways that like elves and magic users and stuff worked. I'll just talk about the magic users here. If you guys want to hear more of that, I could talk about that whole set of house rules I made, which I think was pretty fun, but let me just talk about the magic users for now. So I gave them two options at start, and they were both options. They don't have to use them, but they were available to them. Um, but I did make one kind of overall rules change, which is I every magic user starts with read magic and three spells in their book which is different than how bx works usually in bx you only have the number of spells in your books that you can cast so you don't have extra spells in bx if you can cast two first level spells that's all you got in your book you don't have extra ones to choose from each day you just have those spells so i gave them that option because i went the other way with elves and allowed that and didn't took that away from them because i was trying to again create some balance um so beyond that which is a very simple thing to do i mean the the i think a lot of people coming into it especially new people to osr immediately look at the magic user spells and grab magic missile because it seems great don't get magic missile <laughs> if you if you're playing by the rules it's the worst spell really i mean it's it's not a very good spell for first level magic user it literally is an attack spell which is not the magic user's strength and you just have the one magic missile yeah it's pretty awesome um because it automatically hits and does a d6 plus one to think damage which will kill most normal people which is awesome if you use it in a roleplay situation but as a first level magic user it's going to feel very unfulfilling especially if you're in dungeons uh, that is the unfortunate thing about that rule that you only have those spells in your book because really if you're trying to optimize it that's why i almost always roll randomly by the way when i play a magic user because otherwise i will always lean towards taking sleep or charm person maybe i'll do a video about that because those spells are super powerful but i digress what you should have in your, what you should be taking is read magic. But the problem with taking read magic is that a lot of magic. We've talked about this before with, with a treasure placement. When I talked about experience points, I talked more about gold. But I feel like people don't give out enough uh, scrolls. I wish I had kept the numbers. I sat down one day and started figuring it out. And scrolls should be a huge amount of the magic items you find. Like it should be one of the main magic items. I believe that scrolls, potions, and magic swords. Uh, not in that order. I think it's 
yeah, maybe that order, are the most common magic items. And you don't see that it's very much. You don't see a lot of scrolls out there. So give out more scrolls, DMs. Players take read magic. You know, uh, anyways, uh, uh, that's a whole other video. Well, let me talk about this first. So here's my rules. So everybody gets uh, the three spells in their books. They can change it up uh, and they get read magic. You know, again, that gives them a change. That makes them a little different than elves who don't have that. Elves are, are different in, in my in my world. They only know the spells they know, right? Um, and also elves can't cast from scrolls in my world either. They, they just know spells. They're innate, basically. Kind of like, I guess, what maybe like a sorcerer would be in like a fifth edition world. Anyways, um, so the magic user has two options though. They have to they have to choose this at first level. Um, you can't do both, at least not at first. Anyways, you could have a familiar, which I love. You know, familiars are great for flavor. Um, and the way that I did, it, I'm just going to read it to you so you can hear the rule and see how I, I did it. Um, familiar. The spirit takes the form of a normal animal with one hit per point per level of the magic user. So a first level magic user familiar is going to have one hit point. It's going to be a normal animal, like a cat or something, right? A familiar fights only in defense, so it's not going to attack, right? Uh, it cannot really die, but disappears in a puff of smoke if killed. It comes back during the next full moon, which requires a ritual uh, that costs 500 gold pieces per magic user level. Uh, however, if the, ma if the familiar is killed, uh, the magic user has to make a save versus paralysis, or they will fall unconscious for two to eight turns. So you do not want to be sending your, your familiar into combat. I mean, the familiar should not be anywhere near fighting. It's really there uh, for two reasons. Familiars allow the magic user to memorize one extra spell of each spell level they're able to cast. Uh, so the example I give is a fifth level enchanter gains a bonus spell level one, two, and three because they can cast those three levels. Uh, the familiar must be in, within one inch, so 10 feet uh, in, inside or 10 yards outside, um, per magic user spell level in order to give them that. You're casting it through the familiar, so um, you um, it needs to be near you. So you can't like have a familiar be an owl and like told you to just fly away and then cast spells all day long. It's got to be near you to do it, so you know, risk-reward, right? Um, the magic user can also see and hear through the familiar's eyes, 6 inches plus 1 inch per level, but when you're doing so, you can do nothing else and you are deaf and blind. I like that. I don't like the idea of like familiars in, in some systems where it's like you can just know what they can see and it's like it there's no harm to you. I love the visual of like the magic user being completely oblivious. Like the world could be blowing up around them. They don't see it. They don't hear it because they are through the eyes of the familiar. They're in that brain. Almost like a trance. That's one option. Uh, and it's cool because right away at first level you get a second bell, right? Um, good. Uh, the other option is a wand. So I like the idea of wands as well. Um... A magic user's wand is similar to a ring of spell storing, uh, but it only works for the magic user who created it. Uh, the wand can hold a number of spells equal to one half the magic user's level rounded up, so first level, one, second level, one, third level, two, right? These are spell levels, not spells. Um, uh, these stored spells can be cast at will as long as the magic user is holding the wand, right? After the spell is used, the wand may, may be recharged by the magic user who must... Uh, cast this replacement spell directly into it. It's just like a ring spell store. You, know, you cast your spell into it. Um, so that means, of course, you can't get up in the morning, take your one spell you have memorized. I mean, you could do this, I suppose. Take the one spell you have memorized and cast it into the wand, and then you wouldn't have a spell, right? Because you would have cast it. So you're going to do it during downtime, basically. Um, and usually, like when I started the campaign, I just allowed them to have the spell in the wand already, because why start the first adventure and be like, no, you haven't done it yet? You know, I mean, let them do it during downtime. Um, uh, the wand is somewhat fragile and can easily be broken or destroyed by normal means. Um, doing so creates a burst of energy, one inch radius per spell level remaining in the wand. Uh, it does 1d6 damage per spell level stored within the wand, uh, save for half damage. So that, that you can do that classic thing if you think you're going to die and break your wand and like blow everybody up around you. Uh, or somebody can do it <laughs> to you, so you can be careful. Um, and then a magic user can create a new wand by performing a ritual. It takes one week and costs 500 gold pieces per magic user level. Um, and I do have a note because you know players. Uh, the wand won't absorb spells that are thrown at it, so it's not a ring. Of, you can't. It's not a, like a. You can't like somebody shoots a fireball at you. I catch it in my wand. You can't do that, of course. You have to cast it into the wand into your own wand. So both of those gives. Um, oh, and I also made a note: spells cannot be removed from the wand by any means, save casting them. I just figured that at some point somebody's going to want to just like empty their wand for some reason. I don't know why they would do that, but I feel like that's just weird. So. I guess I would also allow Dispel Magic, now that I'm thinking of it, but in any case, uh, this gives magic users more options, especially at first level, it gives them an extra spell. However, 
that being said, my little notes over here, um, what that does is it then puts you in the position of saying, okay, cool, um, uh, my magic user can shoot two spells a day and then I'm worthless. It's the exact same thing. Whether you give a magic user one spell or two spells, unless you give them some form of like unlimited spells or a very large number of spells, you're always going to have that perceived problem that they're not magical enough because they can't just cast whenever they want. Um, so I did mess around. I also mentioned this really quickly. I did mess around with the idea of cantrips just being like random magic stuff that a magic user can do. Um, and I kind of left it open-ended. Uh, I played with that a couple times on one shots uh, and like a couple, you know, short session uh campaigns what i found was it either was like irritating because they were just doing stupid stuff all the time i'm gonna light a candle i'm gonna you know which is fine but it's like just randomly doing it it's like um or they just kind of forgot about it you know because it was like okay i can light a candle after like the third session it's like i'm gonna light a candle again like it just i don't know it just didn't it didn't really add anything in my opinion to them feeling more magical because again it was anything you just give to the players i feel they just absorb it. It's kind of like the idea of plus one armor or even a plus one sword. Right? If you give somebody a plus one sword, what they do is they write sword plus one on their sheet and then when they write down their damage for the sword, they just d8 plus one. And then three sessions into it, they forget they have a magic sword. It doesn't matter. They just do a d8 plus one, right? It doesn't, it doesn't mean anything to have that magic sword. That's why intelligent swords, are, in my opinion, are better. This is especially true of magic armor because you forget about it. You're always just writing your armor class down. Um, so somebody has an awesome magic shield and like they totally forget as long as they're using a shield they know their armor class it's like anyways uh, I digress that's another video <laughs> um, so uh, this is why I'm not in favor of that I just feel like again anything that's just kind of a give me that they don't have to work for um, I feel like people don't feel like they earn it and thus it's less interesting excuse me my uh, voice is going these days also The, once I started actually reading Dying Earth, which I didn't do until I was an adult, I really started to understand advancing, advancing in magic, and I really loved the idea of it. And if you read a few of the stories, you, you, you get it, I think. Or you don't, maybe you still don't like it. But it's just a different way that magic is. It makes it very, very weird and interesting and gonzo. And that's why I like my games, you know, more so than, let's say, Harry Potter, you know, wands casting, which is also a fun way to play, but it's just a different way. Um <clears throat> Okay, so here's things that I would recommend. And this is going to be both from the player end and the DM end. I haven't done all these things too much to know that any of them are perfect, but I do know that they generally are good. Uh, one thing I've heard people say is that, well, I just start first level magic users out and I give them a couple of scrolls and I just have them start with read magic. Okay, that's fine. And I like that idea, actually. I like that a lot. Except for the fact that, because um, again, I already mentioned there's even more scrolls, Except for the fact that, again, once they cast those scrolls, they're going to feel like they don't have any spells because they only have read magic. That means you have to make sure you give them more scrolls as they go. If you're not giving them scrolls, until they get to second level, they really have no spells. Which, again, is fine if you're in that kind of a world, but something you've got to be very careful with. So I don't recommend necessarily doing that. I've also heard people say, well, I give them some scrolls, and I don't make them have to use read magic for those scrolls so they can take another spell. That's also fine. I mean... Not really what I would do. Uh, my advice for a DM is to think about what, and also for players, think about what is the classic magic user character, like Bill, right? Uh, ooh, I say more Bill, but, you know, it's going to be usually a high intelligence character because, not that it matters, you actually don't have to have high intelligence to be a magic user, um, but make that matter, right? Let the magic user, um, so number one, just in the basic rules, right, is that you get more languages, right? Make that count. I've been in way too many adventures as a player, uh, and I've done it as a DM, where like people enter caverns, they always just have this magical light around them, so nobody's thinking about uh, torches, right? And, uh, you know, everybody just speaks common, you know? It's like, no matter where you go, all the orcs are speaking common, the dragons speak common, the kobolds speak common, the lizards speak common, everybody speaks common, right? That has an intelligence. So everybody can converse with them. That removes one of the basic features of having high-end, which is knowing a lot of languages. So allow the magic user to use that, you know, you know, and hopefully encounter creatures that they speak the language of. Um, there's a few ways you can do that. One way is that if you want to kind of fudge a little bit, 
you can just tell people, don't write down the languages you know, and then when you encounter stuff, you can just choose if you want that language at that moment. That's a simple way to do it. That way people don't take a bunch of random languages of monsters you're never going to uh, use. And also you can justify that basically by being like, well, these are the most common monsters in the world. You, you would kind of know that, but I don't want to tell you all the monsters because that takes some of the excitement out of it. You could do that. Uh, the other option is to, if they don't speak the language, you could allow an intelligence check to at least be able to communicate on some level. Again, they got a high intelligence, so if you do that basic rule or option rule that they have in the basic book of rolling a d20 under your int, you can then say, well, you know, you don't speak the bugbear, but, you know, you can get the general gist of it across, you know, because of your intelligence, right? Um, also, again, either doing an intelligence test or just allowing them, they should just know magical stuff. Like, if there's something going on that's magical, just allow the magic user a chance to know it, you know? They understand. They come into a ritual chamber. They might understand what that chamber's for. They see a magic item. They kind of might have a hint already what it might do without just a, you know, I mean, I wouldn't automatically just let them know, but, you know, they might have an idea. Oh, this sword has strange runes on it. Oh, I want to examine it. I'm a magic user, right? Um, and maybe you could be like, oh, yeah, you would know that certain blah, blah, blah and l lawful forces fighting the blah, blah, made swords like this. And you can give them some lore, right? Let that be important to, to their character, that they that they know these things. And again, that's not them casting magic, it's them understanding magic. Uh, if there's any kind of magical puzzles and stuff, although I like to let people try to solve puzzles, but maybe if they're stuck, give the magic user a little bit of hint. Um, stuff like that, where, again, because they're a magic user, they should know stuff about magic. Um, let's see what else I wrote down here. Magic and lore, just lore in general. Um, also, if the, the campaign is such that it seems to make sense, allow them to research and do things that are not fancy and magic. Uh, the book does actually talk about this a little bit, about like ritualistic and long spells. I think it talks about it in the expert book. Uh, I'd have to look at, look at it, but it does talk about it a little bit. It kind of type makes it kind of like, well, it's not in the scope of, uh, you know, uh, the game and whatever DM should decide. So do that, right? Your magic user can't cast five spells a day, but they can take, you know, 24 hours and build a bonfire and, and do these rituals because they found these books to do certain other kinds of spells. You know, spells that maybe aren't in the book that they're just going to create for them or things that maybe simulate things that, uh, like, they may not be able to, uh, let's say, cast ESP, right? I don't know, just by themselves. But they might be able to do this special trance where they can, like, sleep for eight hours and, like, send their soul out to... Uh, to read the mind of something, you know, and this could be something they could research, right? Have them spend gold on it, have them spend time, talk about it, create it, um, create these things as non Vancean spells so they don't count as spells in the spell book. Like, I'd count this as something extra that they can do. And it's not something they're going to be able to spontaneously do all the time. It's something that'll be part of their story that they're learning these spells, and then they'll be able to use them sometimes when it's relevant. Maybe it could even be, okay, this can only be done once a year when the certain moons align and you just happen to be researching and you realize it's like right now, so you can do it, that kind of thing, you know? Uh, and I think that's super, super extra, a super good way to add extra spells to the to the game without making it, so again, blowing stuff up wherever they go and nuking it, right? It, it's there literally, most of those spells should be like researchy kind of spells or spells that give some kind of a, a more of an overarching magical, you know, uh, premonitions and stuff like that, you know? Uh, all right, good. Sorry that. Okay, so now from the player's point of view, you want to play a magic user. Uh, and again, these you should talk a lot with your DM because if you want to play a magic user and you want to be feel more magical, it's a good idea to to have certain discussions so that when you do things that you know the DM's on board. Unless you just have somebody who know. Well, you never know if somebody would be. So it's always a good idea to have at least a loose discussion with them so they don't just look at you and go no. Although as a DM, I don't recommend that. Let people play up their magic users as long as it's not going to break the game. Um, number one. NPCs, monsters, even the other PCs do not know what you are capable of. This is the key to being a magic user. Now, this doesn't allow them to be more magical in the sense that they can cast spells, but what it does do is it creates a situation where nobody knows like what you can do. You can talk up your powers all day long, and then every once in a while, drop a spell that's awesome, and people will fear you, right? They don't know what else you could do. They don't even know you only have one spell a day. If the DM is playing the way they should be, and if you're a DM and listen to this, don't nobody knows anybody's level, right? So when a 
a town is circled around this magic user, let's say they only did have magic missile. And the magic user just points it like the burliest uh, normal human. It points his finger and drops them dead with one shot. The friggin' town is going to run. They're going to be like, you just killed our most powerful uh, man here with a, with a point of your finger. They don't know you only have one magic missile a day and you have two hit points. They don't know that. You should play that up as the as the magic user, and the DM should let you play that up as a, as a magic user. Nobody knows how powerful you are. In fact, DMs, if you're watching this or from your running games, I can't tell you the number of times that I've had NPC magic users that were not powerful at all. They were like second level, and the parties have been afraid of them because of the way that I played them up, because they don't know. So it's important. It's hard as a DM sometimes because you know, but you don't know. Keep that in mind. Um... Okay, so again, magic users are smart. So whenever you're going on an adventure that doesn't require you to just, the DM's just not dropping you in front of the, the, the cavern or whatever, ask about doing research. You're a magic user, you're intelligent, you should have connections, you should have books. Ask about researching, try to get more information, and the DM should be generous with this, I think, if you get good roles or the, you, you kind of explain what you want. Oh, we're going to this temple, blah, blah, blah. What types of magic did they do there? What type of things could I expect? And then if you do this research, then you should get bonuses, you know, to whatever you're doing when you get there. You know, let's say you do a bunch of research and then you show up and the door is locked with some kind of magical seal or, you know, puzzle. You might know how to do it because you read in the research how to do it. So, again, it's not magical as in throwing a spell at them, but it's magical in the sense that you have information. Information is power uh, or can be if the game is played, you know, in a certain way. So another thing that you could do, which I think is really, these two things kind of uh, tie in. Um, and actually, a player, uh, a player of mine, Troy, uh, did this. I wonder if this adventure is up. It might be somewhere. I think it was a, a Swords and Wizardry game. But he actually did the first thing a lot. We started playing. I think they were second level characters or whatever. And he played this magic user that was a, he, he was a potion vendor, he said. And, and like... He just was lying through his teeth. Like, I knew as the GM that he didn't have all these things. But he was just constantly saying that he had things that could do things. And the other characters believed him. Because he he bought into it. Like, he was like... He, he pitched it so truthfully that all the other players, and, and thus their PCs, completely believed him. Um, so, allowing... Um, and I and I allowed him to have a few different things. Like, he'd be like, I open up a vial and pull it, pop it open and green smoke fills the area. You know, I was like, yeah, yeah, right? Because me as a DM, I'm like, that's friggin' awesome. Let players do that. As a player, create stuff like that. Maybe little flash power, power, uh, little flash uh, powder things or, or potions that smell really bad or that have phosphorus and glow. Things that you could have on your person that seem magical, even if they're basically mundane. Um, and again, talk to the GM about it. To make DM about to make sure that you know you, you you're not going to cross the line, of course. But DMs let your players do this. Let the magic users have these little non-magical magic things, because you got to figure that in a world like like this, where there is actually magic, there's got to be a lot of this like pseudo fake magic out there as well. So I would definitely allow it. Again, nothing that's going to do damage in combat or do anything serious, unless they get super clever. Who knows? You know, just stuff to give them a flavor, and again, that they can use when manipulating. And this is my second line here is that carry weird and interesting ingredients to bluff people. You know, the idea of like a whole bunch of kobolds are standing there with, with their with their spears ready to charge and they're uncertain. And the magic user steps forward and sprinkles this like line of colored uh, chalk on the ground and says a few words and says, if you cross this line, you will be disintegrated. You know, no, they don't have that spell. The kobolds don't know that. Right. This is the thing. Right. It's all about that. And in these cases, just so uh, I'll say, because I know this could be a thing, if you're gonna, if you're not going to just let that work, which I might do, um, depending on how well the player described it, what I would, if you're going to make them roll for it, any kind of reaction that they'd normally use a charisma modifier for, let them use their int. Because they're doing it in a way that's like using their knowledge, not, their, not necessarily their charisma. Now, of course, if they have a higher charisma than intelligence, then that's fine as well. I think one thing that, you know, I'm guilty of this myself is that I think we tend to roll too much, like roll the dice. 
And in these circumstances, I think a lot of times you just have to judge like what these people might do. Like I might just immediately give them a morale check um, or do another reaction roll with some kind of penalty. It's the same thing with the morale check. Um, so I think that another kind of thing that I'm just going to say here, which is you probably, this is fairly common advice and doesn't have anything to do necessarily with using magic for magic. Um, think about a few things that you might get, right? As you're... Um, let me just look at my note here to see what, if I can put this all in one sentence here. Yeah. You're going to roll the same gold as everybody else, right? There's not a whole lot for you to buy, right? I mean, you don't need armor. You can only use a dagger. So a magic user is probably going to end up with some some, some gold at the beginning, some extra gold. DMs allow the... the I, I recommend allowing a magic user to immediately have a higher link. Um, you know, uh, they... Again, a first level dude with a sword, even if they have to spend some of their money to buy that person whatever equipment they're going to have. This does two things. Number one, it gives the the, the magic user a little bit of uh, clout, right? You know, because it's always good to have a higher link. But also, when you do go into combat, because the magic user should not be running into combat. And I know how players are. You, a combat starts happening, and it gets to your turn, and you're just like, I, I just stand here. And you feel maybe a little bit like you're not taking part in the game. I get that, right? Um... If you're, you, to, to alleviate that a bit, if you have this henchman fighter, you can just basically be like, okay, you know, I've got this, I hire this fighter who's even some normal man, he's got a bow and some arrows, you know, when we get into combat, I'm going to stand behind him and he's going to shoot arrows and then let DMs, even if you are the type of DM that lets, that prefers to control the henchman as far as personalities and stuff, let the player, you, you know, roll the rolls for the attacks and stuff. It will allow the, uh, that player that plays the magic user to take part in combat, this has nothing to do with the original question, but I think it's important, right? Um, it just gives them something to do in combat because they can't be casting spells all the time. So what are you guys doing? You know, do any of these ideas seem interesting? Have you done things like this? I mean, I don't think all these are original. I'm sure that I've absorbed some of these from reading, reading many vlogs, watching many videos. Um, certainly the idea of people handing out scrolls. I know the idea of, like, giving, again, a bonus spell if they have high intelligence, like they do in AD&D for uh, clerics. With high wisdom, they give a bonus spell, so we'll do that in BX and other games. Again, I don't necessarily recommend that. I used to. I used to think, yeah, let's just give the magic user a few more spells a day, and that will make them more magical. But the more I play, and the more I think about it, the idea of the magic user not having any more spells they can cast, only that one Vancean spell, but all these other things, the, the little uh, trick potions and the, the, the weird, you know, a sack full of, you know, live oct tiny octopus pie or, you know, uh, salt and uh, smelling things and, and things they can throw on the ground that flash. Things that are basically not actually magical but feel magical. And the idea of letting them have their space to, like, know things. You know, you get into a weird chamber. Oh, you're a magic user. You would definitely know this was used for blah, blah. You know, or, again, if it's something that's a dangerous trap and you don't want them to just know, have them roll under their int. Um, and the other thing I would definitely say is make sure that, especially if you're playing straight BX, uh, and that they take read magic, and even if they don't at first level, give them a bunch of scrolls. Give them scrolls. Scrolls allow a magic user so much more power in BX because you can cast a scroll at any level. Meaning that if you're a second level magic user and you pick up a fifth level spell, you can still cast it from the scroll. So... Allow the magic users to find scrolls. Let's say that you, the magic user takes charm person or, or shield or whatever, light at first level, um, and they find half a dozen scrolls in their course of building up through adventures. When they go to second level, they're going to take read magic. Now, all of a sudden, they've got all these scrolls, right? So that's a pretty good te technique that I found is to, like, if magic users aren't going to take read magic at first level, um, maybe still give a decent amount of scrolls. That way... Uh, they'll be like, okay, uh, I can take Read Magic next level and have all these spells. So that's a, that's an option there, guys. Uh, if you use familiars or you use wands, I mean, let me know how they work out or if you have a different variation. I'd be curious about that. One thing I definitely don't like is the familiar that, like a, a 5e familiar where you can just like snap it in and out of existence. I feel like that doesn't suit the familiar well. Uh, and also, I feel like choosing between the familiar and the wand really comes down to play style, not power. I mean, I guess you could look at it and figure out which one is the more powerful thing, but... I feel like you have a familiar if you're more of like a a, a witch kind of character that's more kind of with the with the earth and you know you're kind of uh, 
tell you, you know, reading portents and stuff like that. Whereas a wand is more like a, a blasty, as they say, a uh, magic user, you know. The, the, so, you know, the for instance, the, the familiar person might take like charm person, right? Where the, uh, as their main spell, whereas a blasty person might take sleep or magic missile, right? Because it's like a different kind of, uh, different kind of person, right? So anyways, um, all that being said and done, that's probably a pretty long video at this point. Uh, let me know, guys. What do you do to make magic users better? Do you agree with this, or do you think, no, no, they suck, and you should just be like 5e and have cantrips and pet cast all day? Uh, you know, what do you think about that? Uh, I'm really curious, because I think this is one of those areas. That and Thieves are the two that... Although I feel like as the years pass and I read more more blogs where people defend the magic user, I think more people get it. I feel like Thieves, people, a lot of people still don't get. So we're definitely going to have to do a video about Thieves, because Thieves are my favorite class in BX. Everyone who says that thieves suck, yeah, I'm going to have a video for you. So we're going to go through that uh, at some point. Let me know what you guys think anyways. And um, also, uh, I made a video a while back where we made an adventure. Are you guys, Would you be interested in seeing more like that? I was thinking about doing one where um, where I do one like from a story I've read. Because that's where I get a lot of my adventures. Like uh, kind of writing out the, instead of like the mechanic of like filling the rooms, writing out like the the um, the sequence of the story, like the plot points, if you will. Um and how I would put that together and weave that into an adventure uh, moving forward. So let me know if you're interested in that. Uh, if you haven't already, go ahead and subscribe, ring the bell and all that so you get the notifications when new videos come up. I appreciate uh, you guys watching, and I'll see you later.